Today's staff we're going to be learning is two about Daf Lamed Zayin. This week's learning is sponsored by Hani Penstein and JJ Hornblast to commemorate the second year outside of their father, Mayor Penstein, Zichrono Lebracha, who loved Daf Yomi and was very proud of Michelle Farber. Today's staff is also sponsored by Lisa Hurt Wilner in loving memory of her grandfather, Mayor Penstein. He loved learning with his grandchildren. He was especially proud to have a granddaughter with whom he could discuss the Daf. Um, I can't also not discuss the fact that Mayor Penstein was a very dear family friend and he is sorely missed by our family as well. Uh, we're now going to start at the bottom of Lamid Vav Amabet. So we saw that Rabbi Yochanan, we had two explanations of Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda and the Mishnah said that a Shvuya, a woman who was taken into captivity, we're not concerned that she was raped or if we are, right? We had two explanations, but we're basically going to treat her for the purposes of knas, as if she wasn't raped, meaning she's a virgin, meaning that the rapist has to um, has to pay the knas. Whereas if she was raped before, right, if she was or had relations, again, it's a little bit unclear from this situation, from, we'll see from today's staff, whether we're concerned that this shvuya willingly have relations with one of her captors or was raped by one of her captors, it seems like we're also concerned that maybe she was a willing participant. Either which way, she wouldn't be a virgin, in which case there would be no knas if she was later raped. So now we had Rabbi Yochanan, who has the purest approach, where he says, Rabbi Yudah thinks this across the board, a shvuya for all kinds of issues is not considered as if she had relations with anyone. Whereas Rabbi says, maybe it's only in this situation, shalom yehei chotei and then we said maybe also for her ketubah so that people won't say, oh, we don't want to marry this woman because she must be not a virgin when we don't know for sure. But for other issues, it could be we will treat her like, for example, maybe we won't let her marry a Kohen, right? Because we are maybe worried. Okay, so it depends. Or maybe we, she can't eat truma. So Rabbi wasn't sure exactly where, right? Or at least he thought that perhaps Rabbi Yehud is not clear about this across the board. So... We asked a question on Rabbah, we resolved it with the Ketubah. Then we asked a question on Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're going to ask another question on Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Le Rav Papa Bar Shmuel Rav Yosef. So Rav Papa Bar Shmuel asked Rabbi Yosef the following question. B'savar Rabbi Yehuda B'kdushatei Kaima? B'kdushata Kaima? Does he really hold that she is in a pure state, meaning she can marry a Kohen, we're sure that she's, nothing happened? The Hatanya doesn't it say, and, and for all intents and purposes, right, for everything, Vatanya doesn't say in a bright Now it's a little bit strange because we're bringing up disproof, okay, or a question against Rabbi Yochanan's understanding of Rabbi Yehuda from a case of a convert. And that's why I say it's not exactly clear what, what the case of the Shvuya is because they seem to think she's like a convert, even though Rabbi Yehuda explicitly distinguished her from a convert. But anyway, we'll, we'll read and then we'll see, we'll try to see why. Okay, the first case is a little bit different. The first issue here, which isn't really relevant for our purposes, relates to really the first mission in Masechet Nida, if anyone learned that remembers. Women in general, when they start to bleed, there's an assumption that maybe they were bleeding before and they didn't notice. So if a woman was touching impure items, there's a debate about whether we say, we don't worry about retroactive, we don't go backwards. That's what we say, dayashata. It means right now she becomes impure and just from the moment she sees blood. Some people think, and this is more of an issue with Tumantara, when people touch kelim, like they touch utensils and people kept things very much in a level of purity. So do we have to worry? According to the, uh, the, the opinion that we hold by, we actually go meidle, which means we go 24 hours backwards and assume that anything she touched, right, a little bit complicated to come up with how you figure that out, Anything she touches now impure, and right, it's, it affects things she sits on, all sorts of things. Or from the last time she checked, if she checked, let's say eight hours ago, then we won't go back 24 hours, we'll only go back eight hours. So now the question is, what about a Giorich and Itgaira? Let's say the day that she converts, not the minute, but the day she converts, she sees blood. Now, when she was not Jewish, she was not impure. There is no impurity for a non-Jewish woman. So now if she sees blood, Rabbi Yudha Omeo, Dayashata. She's different from a Jewish woman. Now she, now she's Jewish. But we go, since she converted within this day, we don't start going backwards. We start from right now, whatever time she saw blood. That's what I said before, 24 hours or from the last check. And in this case, it won't necessarily be 24 hours. It'll go back to the moment she converted. So either the moment she converted or if she happened to check herself after that, to make sure there was no blood, 
then it would go from her last check. Okay. That's not really so relevant for our purposes, but it's the beginning of the bright. Next issue. When a woman converts, she needs to wait three months. Why the three months? If you learn Yavama, you'll know there's this concern. Three months is the time that it takes to determine whether the woman's pregnant. So we want to make sure that she's not pregnant from before she converted. So, and then also the father's not Jewish. So basically she has to wait three months from the moment she converts until she can marry someone else. But as soon as she marries someone else, she'd get pregnant. And then we won't know who the child is. And we won't know is the child Jewish, right? Is it from before her conversion, after her conversion, all sorts of issues. But really the main thing is that she had slept with somebody else. And then there'll be a confusion as to who the father is and whether it's it's Zera Bikdushara, she says, or Zera Hanizlasha Lobikdusha, right? Was it she pregnant from before, or after? Okay, all sorts of issues. So she should wait. Rabbi Yossi, Matir Leares, Ulina Semiyad. So Rabbi Yossi says, no, she can get married right away. So now comes the question. Rabbi Yehuda says that if we have to wait with this convert, because she might have had relations before, same thing with the Shvuya. Don't we have to be concerned? Did she have relations when she was a shvuya? Now, again, the, the issue is, first of all, why are we comparing a shvuya and a giorit, right? Ra, Tosfot asked this question. And it could be that we're assuming here, right? Ra, Tosfot says, if she was planning to convert, then from the moment she's planning to convert, she's already knowing that she's going into becoming the, part of the Jewish people. And then therefore, you would assume that she'd be careful about who she sleeps with, right? Knowing what's going to, what's coming her way. So in that sense, she's like the Shvuya, that again, assuming they have control over the matter, right? That they're the ones in, in again, it's very hard with the Shvuya if you assume that she was totally raped and forced, it was forced upon her because this again, seems to, to say she had some sort of control over it. So in any case, the Gemara says, Amalek, Giyoret a Shvuya Karamit? Wait, why are you comparing a Giyoret to a Shvuya? It's very different. Despite what Tosfot suggested, right? Tosfot suggested really for the, the suggestion of what they thought. So in the end, a giyoret, you can't really assume that she watched herself, but a shvuya mintra nafsha, but a shvuya would watch herself. Okay, this is a potential explanation, but it's not going to really hold anyway. And if you're a little bit concerned, what do you mean? A giyoret, of course, can watch herself. She's about to convert to Judaism. Well, don't worry. The Gemara anyway is going to put them all in the same boat. Right now, we're just trying to see maybe they're not in the same boat. Okay, and maybe we could come up with an answer. But in one minute, the Gemara is going to reject this entirely. I want to just, before we go on, I want to talk about practical. Nowadays, when a convert, a woman, a female converts, we actually don't necessarily always make her wait the three months. There's a lot of situations where we get around this by taking a pregnancy test. Okay, and then how do we do this? Because we basically say that Theoretically, we do say she watch it, right? She's We're assuming she's going through a process and that she'll be cautious about it. There's also often she's either, first of all, she's married to someone and they're both converting. Well, then they're living together, right? You want to let her stay married. You're not going to make them separate for three months. And also if a lot of times people are converting in order to get married and then we want to, right? you're not going to start making them wait the three months, right? Again, the assumption is, she knows she's going to get married and that that's all purpose. So she's obviously careful. Anyway, there are ways to get around this. I don't know all the halakhic nuances and how we get around it. But there are ways to get around this and also by taking a pregnancy test. Um, even though we don't use that, for example, in normal cases of divorcees who are trying to get married or husband died, we usually do make them wait the three months. So it's interesting just to see. Um, anyway, I, again, without getting into all the details, there are differences here. Okay, now, now the Gemara says, okay, so you were bringing Shvuya with convert, maybe that's not a contradiction, but Rami Shvuya Shvuya comes from Papa or Shmuel, and he said, but I have a better one, okay? I have a case where there's a Shvuya, exactly, and, you know, the exact opposite. So did Tanya, Hagiyoret v'shvuya v'shipcha, shenifdu v'shenitgairu v'shenishtachu, yitirot abanot shalosh shanim v'yom echad. So if you have a convert, or a uh, a woman in captivity or a maidservant, Canaanite maidservant, who were redeemed or converted or freed older than three and one day. They all need to wait three months. Here you see clearly Rabbi Yehuda doesn't think that for all intents and purposes, we assume the Shifcha has not had relations with anyone. Why? Otherwise, he wouldn't make her wait the three months. So how do we reconcile that with the way Rabbi Yochanan understood Rabbi Yehuda? 
And that's the very Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Matir Le'ares, Rabbi Nassim, yeah. So Ishtik, he was silent. Then Amar Le'i Midi Shmiel Achbaha, so he says to him, have you heard anything about this? Amar Le'i, he answers him back, yes, in fact, I, I do, I have. Hachi Amar Rav Shesha, Shera'ua Shenivala. Rav Shesha said, it's a case where they saw that she had had relations with someone. That's why they make her wait three months, which sounds like a great answer, great resolution to the contradiction with Rabbi Yehuda. What's the problem? Well, Ihachi, my time into Rabbi Yossi. So then why doesn't Rabbi Yossi make her wait the three months if that's the case? To which Amar Rabbi explains, Kasava Rabbi Yossi, Isha Mizana Meshamesha B'moch Shalotitabe. A woman who sleeps around, now again, you have to worry, wonder, why is he calling her a woman who sleeps around? Weren't we just assuming she was raped by her captives? So either you could say he uses the word mizaneh loosely, and he doesn't really mean sleeps around, but maybe was slept with, was treated like a prostitute. Or we say again, maybe there's really a concern that she was a willing participant in this. So to which they say, Isha uh, mizana, a woman who sleeps around, she protects herself. She uses right? Birth control. Okay. In those cases, a moch, a moch is something like a tampon. She puts something inside to collect the semen so that she won't get pregnant. And that's why we're not worried. So now, interesting. Now we have to understand, well, who are we assuming plans ahead, right? They're pl- right? They're, they're smart about their plan. So, we're assuming that they have to have some ulterior motive of being part of the Jewish people, that they don't want to get pregnant because they want, you know, they're they're anticipating being part of the Jewish people or being returned from captivity or something like that. So it, it makes sense with the with the gear. Right? We're assuming otherwise she wouldn't care about getting pregnant, which is interesting. Obviously, nowadays, many people use birth control in all sorts of situations, Jewish, not Jewish, right? But anyway, that's just interesting. But Giyore, so Kevan did that tell the again, we get back to this concept, and this is where Tosfa got it from, he didn't make it up. Since she's planning to convert, she protects herself, right? So she's making sure she's obviously, if she is going to have a relationship with someone, she's going to use birth control so that she's not pregnant, so she doesn't mess things up going forward. Shvuya nami, dilo yada hechamematula. The Shvuya has no idea what her next day is going to look like, meaning she might get returned home, and then she'll want to make sure that, you know, she doesn't have to wait three months to go marry somebody. Shifcha nami, deshama mipi mara. Shifcha also. The assumption here is that when they get back to Judaism, right, they'll want to get married. So they protect themselves so that they, so she must have heard from her master that he was planning to free her. So she had time to prepare. So she made sure to use birth control. Ella, yotzav v'shem v'ayim. But what about a woman who d- becomes free from slavery immediately? For example, if he pulls out her tooth by accident, her master, or her eye, knocks out her eye, or some sort of break in her body, a bone, she gets freed immediately. And then you can't say, oh, well, don't worry about the past three months, because she was prepared for this. She wasn't prepared for this at all. Okay, the law is if you if you break a slave's some part of their body, an important part of their body, they go free. So, right, it's a way also of protecting them, right, from so that the master is careful not to hit them. Maybe he wasn't talking about cases like that. Maybe he was only talking about the cases we talked about before. But if the shifcha leaves b'shem ba'ayin, no, then she wouldn't be able to get married right away. But you can't say that because Amar Rabbi Yossi, hare anusal mefuta, if a woman is raped or seduced where she didn't have any time to prepare, then in that case, mimela, which happens unexpectedly, Vitanya, now we're just talking about a regular woman, right, who's Jewish. Vitanya, anusa mufuta, tzricha lantin shlosha chadashin, divre rebi Yehuda, verbi yossi matir la resu lina semiyad. The same argument is the same opinions by one who's raped or seduced, which means she's obviously not using birth control. She didn't have any warning time for this. Okay, the assumption is a woman who's seduced also was seduced at the moment. She wasn't planning on doing anything. So, Ella Amarada, Kasava Rabbi Yossi, Okay, if you want to take advice about birth control from the Gemara, I'm not sure this is the best advice to take. But he says, we're not worried she's pregnant because what will she do if she's raped or seduced? She'll turn upside down after, the semen will come out, and that will be her birth control. To which he's not worried, therefore, that she needs to wait three months because obviously she's done that. So if that's really a good method of birth control, then why doesn't Rabbi Yehuda think so? 
So, Idach, Rabbi Yehuda, the other opinion, okay, which you could explain in two ways. Either we're worried maybe she didn't do a good job of it, or number two, which you and I are probably thinking, which is that's not really a very um, good method of birth control, not very um, reliable. So he doesn't want to rely on that to allow them to get married. Very interesting approach of Rabbi Yossi, I will say. Okay, next. The last words in our Mishnah were, to which we said at the time, wait, but don't we learn it from somewhere else? So that's exactly what the Gemara is going to ask. It says about the Pesukim about lashes, it says, right, then he when he gives him lashes, according to the bad thing he did. From there, they learn you only get punished for one bad thing and not for two bad things. That's the law of Kimlin. So the Gemara answers very simply, right? Notice context of the first pasuk was death. If the chat, right, if the mother isn't killed, then you pay money. But if she is killed and it's death penalty, you don't pay money. That's no death and monetary payment, right? The monetary payment gets erased or ignored. And the other one, Kadeva Shato, is to teach you when there's lashes and mama, only lashes, not monetary payment. Now, why do you need both? Utsricha. Te'ish mina mita umama, you would have said, mishum de'ika ibud nishama. Since mita has death associated with it, you're getting the death penalty, we're not going to make you pay anything more. That's already pretty harsh. But maybe if you're only getting lashes, maybe we'll also have you pay the money as well. It's not as severe. You could say the opposite. You could flip it and say, listen, because malkot is not so, so chamul, then you might say, that's why we're not going to make you pay the money. Because you didn't do anything so terrible. You're only liable lashes for it. So we'll exempt you from the money. But if you kill somebody and you, or you do something that you're liable, the death penalty for, that's very severe. If while you did that, you incurred also monetary payment, it's so severe, we're going to make you pay the money as well. Therefore, tzricha, that's why we need to teach it in both cases. But wait, that all works if you hold that you need, right, that there's mita overrides money and malkot overrides money. But Rabbi Meir says that you get both lashes and you pay. Remember that opinion? So according to him, what do you need both psukim for? Chad abimita umamon, one for mita and mamon, and chad abimita umalkot. Ah, when you have mita and mamon and mita and malkot, you need one for each. Death overrides lashes and death overrides money. Utsricha, we're already now in Amabet. And you need them both. Why would you need both? If you had mita and mamon and the pasuk was just for that, then you would say, listen, when you have one thing that's on your body and one thing that's from, that's from your money, so we're not going to make you do both. Because those, okay, now you could obviously say the reverse, but we're going to say those are two very different things. So we're going to say one exempts the other. Since mita and malkot lashes are both on your body. Maybe malkot is like the precursor of the death penalty. And that maybe you actually need to get both. And now we're going to do the reverse logic, which to me seems like better logic, more logic I would have thought of more likely. You would have said, we're not going to make you do two punishments to your body. But but since one is your body and one has to do with your monetary payment, right? One is from your pocket and one is from your on your body. Maybe you would think you'd need to do both. So that's why you need, according to Rabbi Meir, one pasuk to exempt you from death and money. That would be lo yasson. And Kedera Chateau is to tell you, even though it's about lashes, well, when there's death and lashes, you're only going to get death and not lashes. So that all resolves that. However, now we're going to start on a whole slew of other drashot, other psukim. We're going to deal with a lot of other psukim. First, we're going to start with a pasuk that they think at the beginning teaches the law of Kimlin. And then they're going to say, we don't need this pasuk. We already have two. 
Okay, the continuation is Bamibar 35, Pasuk 31. Lotikul Kofar, don't take ransom, Lenefesh Rotsef, and play right for the death of a for the for the a murderer. Asherhu Rashalamut, right? Because he's supposed to die, Mot Yumat, he's supposed to die. Now, the way they understand this Pasuk is different from the way we understood it the first time we saw this. We saw this not so long ago, which is don't take payment as well as the death penalty. Meaning if you're going to get the death penalty, then you don't have to pay as well, right? To pay, let's say, the family of the people who you murdered. So right nowadays, we always pay damages to the family, right? There's always, there's often, I, I don't know, it's actually a good question. When people get just jail and when they also pay money of damages to the family, right? Or do they do both? So this is really what's what's going on here. So they say, if you, so that pasuk, Lamali, why do you need that pasuk? We already have the law of Kimle, which would be obvious then you wouldn't. To which the Gemara says, no, what they're saying is, don't think you could pay your way out of the death penalty. Meaning, don't think you could just pay money and then not have to get the death penalty. So now they ask the same thing about this next pasuk. Why do you need this pasuk? Don't take ransom instead of going to the ir miklat. So again, at this point, they think it means don't pay also in addition to going to the ir miklat. To which they say, no, don't think that you could pay your way out of going to the Ir Mikla, to the city of refuge, if you accidentally kill someone. Why do you need both those sukim? Because they're both really saying, if you killed someone, you can't get out of it by paying money. Either you have to go to Ir Mikla, the refuge city, if it was accidental, or you have to go uh, get the death penalty. To which the Gemara says, you need one for accidental murder and one for intentional murder. You need them both. You would have said, Mezid is very serious. And that's why you can't pay your way out. But maybe if it was accidental, maybe you could pay your way out. Shogeg, you might say you can't pay your way out because you have to go to the city of refuge. And what's the big deal? We're not killing you. But of amazing, the Ike Ibud Neshama, but amazing when we're actually going to kill you and institute capital punishment, Amalo, maybe we are going to give you a way to get out of capital punishment, right? Who wants to do that? In fact, the Gemara in Sanhedrin even says the Sanhedrin that killed one in 70 years considered a murderous Sanhedrin. So we'd obviously rather avoid that. In which case they say, Tzrichad, no, but you can't avoid it by paying your way out. There's no way. Now we're getting off the topic of Kimle. Since we started with these psukim, we're now going to find other psukim that seem to say the same idea, which is you can't pay your way out of the death penalty. To which the Gemara says, and This is a pasuk in Bami Bar Lamed He, also in the pasuk about murder and murderers, and there's accidental and intentional murder. So they say the, the land will not be atoned for blood that was spilled, unless we spill blood. Sounds like you have to die if you killed someone and you can't pay your way out. So Lamali, why do we need that if we have the other pasuk already? You need it for the following bright time. Okay, we have to give some background. Egla Rufa is a situation where we find a dead body and we don't know who killed it. So we measure and we find where is it, what's the city closest to? The closest city has to come out, the elders of their city, and break the back of a neck of, of, a, of a calf by a, by a river, by a, by a stream, a nachalitan, and it's a whole ceremony they do to basically say, we're not responsible for the death. Now, what if you did that? And then, but then you find the murderer. How do you know he's not exempt? Maybe you'd say, we already dealt with this. We already atoned for this sin. So maybe you don't have to die. Ah, because it says, no, land will never be at peace, right? Until you settle the, the, the murder, you have to kill the murderer, even though we did that. This, by the way, is similar to we talked about not so long ago about an asham taloi, which is a, a, right, it's a hanging sin offering or guilt offering. You bring it when you're not sure if you're supposed to bring a sin offering. If you did something wrong or not, you're not sure. Whether you did it accidentally wrong, or maybe you didn't do anything wrong at all. So you bring this Hashem Taloi. And what do we say? When that only takes care of atoning you temporarily, just like the Egla Rufa, it's temporary. Until such time that we find out that you actually did the sin, or that someone actually, we found the murderer, then they actually need atonement. 
This is a temporary type of atonement, okay? It only works so long as we don't ever find out, okay? But once we find out the truth, then we actually have to deal with it. So then they say, okay, well, if that pasuk is teaching that, then at the end of the Egla Rufa section, it says, and you have to um, just, right, get rid of any dam naki, which really means anyone who spilled blood for no reason, meaning a murderer, you have to wipe out from your midst. So wouldn't that be telling you what we thought the previous pasuk that we just quoted is telling you? That basically, if you find the murderer, you have to kill him? Well, no, that pasuk is coming to teach you something else. This is like a game, right? What does each verse come to teach? If that one's teaching that, then this one must come to teach something else. If you kill someone with a su- with saif, meaning in the courts, the courts which one of the death penalties is called herod, which is death by the sword. So how do you know that when you do it by the sword, that you do it by the neck? Maybe you do it in the stomach, maybe you do it somewhere else. Because that appears in the Egla Rufa section, right, which means basically anytime you have to avenge someone's death, if you're a murderer, by the way, the murder, the death penalty that you get is Herod, this death that we're talking about. So hukshu koshofchei damim la Egla Rufa. See, this pasuk is coming to tell you anyone who murders is like the Egla Rufa. In what way? We said it's the back of the neck. They would break on the animal. So since that's on the neck, Herod is done on the neck, not in the back though, in the front. So now they're going to say, well, there you use a big cleaver, and on the back of the neck. So let's do it exactly like the Egla Rufa with a big cleaver and on the back of the neck. Very important halacha. Amar kra. Because we love our fellow man as ourselves, even though he's deserving of death, we want to kill him in the quickest way possible. So we want to use precision, so we're not going to use a big cleaver, and we want to do it in the front, so we can basically cut the two simanim, right? This goes back to shechita of an animal, right? Where you, you cut the esophagus and the trachea right away, we want to kill him instantly so that he doesn't suffer any more pain. Very pleasant images in your head. Okay, next pasuk. Any cherem, which is yecharam in adam, lo yipadeh, mot yumat, the end of the pasuk says. What is this talking about? Cherem is usually, this is in the section about erchin, the value of people that are given to the temple. Cherem is usually a gift you give to the kohen. But here they seem to be saying, if you have someone, cherem means deserving of the death penalty. And there's a pasuk that says, if you offer up to idols, you will be yecharam, which means you'll be killed. So here it also seems to mean killing. Anyone who's supposed to be killed, min adam, seemingly because he killed a person or or, of, or a person who's supposed to be yecharam, lo yipade, cannot be redeemed, mot yumat. Seems to say the same thing again. There's no way to get out of the death penalty, right? You can't pay your way out. So lamali, what do you need this pasuk for? So again, they're going to have to say this teaches you something else. Me we need it for the following bright. How do you know that if someone was convicted of death and somebody says, I'm giving the value of that person to the temple? How do you know? He doesn't have to give anything. From the language of, you don't have to give his value to the temple. If you promise his value to the temple, that person is worth nothing because they're a dead man. Maybe even before the judgment. Well, Tamul Lamar Min Adam. Now they're darshaning other parts of that pasuk. Min Adam, Min always means not every case. So Min comes to say the local Adam, not every case. Some cases, yes, some cases, no. Where do we draw the line? If he was judged already and it was convicted, then yes. If he wasn't yet convicted, then he's still worth something. But this isn't going to work according to one person's opinion. There's a set amount in the Torah. It's given for what every person is valued at. Woman, man, we'll get to this in Erechen. You're not going to be so happy because women aren't worth the same as men. We'll talk about that many years later in a number of years when we get to Masech at Erechen. But people, depending on your age, okay, because it really depends on the work market. I'll already give you a clue to what we're going to get to. It's all about what your value is in the shuk. Women were worth less in the shuk in those days. Also depending on your age. Depending on your age, you're worth more in the shuk or less in the shuk, depending on how hard you can work at that age. So, but there's set amounts depending on if you're male, female, what age you are, et cetera. So it doesn't matter if you're deserving of the death penalty. You're still 
uh, a person of whatever age range, whatever sex you are, and you fit into a category and it's a set amount. So if it's erchin, then yeah, you get that set amount. So so we can't use this pasuk to teach that, oh, he doesn't have a value because he thinks he does. So he says, ah, me buy a little he needs it for a different praita. So he says, since we found mumatim bide shamayim, if you're some cases where you're deserving of the death penalty by the hands of God, you actually can pay your way out. All of a sudden, we're going to get an exception to this rule we've seen so clearly that you can't pay your way out. Where is this? in This is in Sefer Shemot, where it talks about if your ox killed a person. We talked about this a few days ago. Shor haniskal. So the shor is niskal. He gets stoned. And then it says, v'gam ba'alav yuma. And also his owner should be put to death. Now, put to death at the hands of God. The next pasuk says, im kofer yushat alav. But if he pays his way out, v'natan pidyon nafsho, he can basically pay his way out of the death penalty. So now they say, since you see that, you might have thought that even if you're high of the death penalty by the hands of man, meaning the court institutes the death penalty, maybe you could pay your way out. Now we already know we have a different pasuk for this, right? The first pasuk we started with, the low tikhu kelfer and the nefesh rotzeh. You can't pay your way out. But right now they're going to use this pasuk to prove it. And soon we're going to ask, I don't understand, didn't we learn it from that pasuk? But that's what Rabbi Hananya ben Avkavia is going to learn from our pasuk. Tanu Rabbanan, cherem min ha'adam lo yipadeh. Meaning if it's min ha'adam, yeah, they're just quoting parts of the pasuk, they're skipping some words. But kol cherem ha'sheyach haram, lo min ha'adam, from adam lo yipadeh. Meaning if you're liable in the hands of man, you cannot be redeemed. Ve'en li ala mitot chamurot shelo nitna shigatan la Maybe it's only death that you can't atone for, but which is regular death in the hands of the court. What about karet? Why is karet different? Karet is, ha- is death in the hands of God. It's more severe than we talked about before, the, the ba'alav yuma by the hands of God. Karet is more serious. However, karet is not as serious as death in the courts because there's a way out. We talked about sin offerings before. Sin offerings are, are given to people who do sins where they're liable, karate, if they did it on purpose, they're actually, if they did it unwittingly, uh, accidentally, they can bring a korban chata. That means, nitna shigigatan le kapara. They have a way to pay their way out. Okay, whereas if, let's say, you killed someone, you can't get out of it by paying your way out, even if it was accidental, you have to go to the Yermiklat, the refuge city. But here, you can get out of it, kare, you can get out of it if it's shkaga with a, with a sacrifice. So you might have thought maybe then you could pay your way out for kare, even if you did it intentionally. Talmud Lomar, kol cherem. No, any cherem, anyone who's liable to the death penalty, again, in the hands of man or maybe kare, but not in the hands of God, Right, mitabi yeshamayim, which is that other case, that one unique case where we will allow you to pay your way out. So that's how Rabbi uh, Hananya ben Akavya is going to understand that pasu again, because he can't use it to teach that the value is worth nothing, which is the way we learned originally. Now they're going to say the question I asked before. And you'll have to wait tomorrow for the answer. The lomi meila mi lotikhu kofer shmamina lotish koma mona mina vetiftere. But didn't you learn lotikhu kofer? Didn't you imply from there? Don't, didn't we already learn? That teaches you, you can't pay your way out. So why are you learning it from this cherem pasuk? And to that, you'll have to wait to hear what Rami Barhama says, why you need both pasukim, which is a kind of repeat of what we kept seeing today, why you need two pasukim for the same idea. Or anytime we had, it seemed like two things were being learned, we somehow said each pasuk is coming, right? The other pasuk is coming to teach something different. Okay, with that, we'll end our daf. Have a great day, everybody.